Hey GP learners, so in this episode I'm going to give you a quick start guide as to how to use System 1 and effectively by the end of this video you'll be able to do simple things like search for patients, start a consultation, orientate yourself around the record, prescribe medications, sort out a med 3 and figure out basically how to use System 1 in its essential basics. Let's tech enhance your primary care and learning. If this is the first time we're meeting, I'm Dr. Gandalf for VGP Learning, we're like supporting you with technology enhanced primary care and learning. And this episode, we're going to give you a crash course of how to use System 1 in its most basic form. When you first log into System 1, it will look something fairly similar to this. So this is the main home page once you've logged in. And effectively, there's various things that you can see from this screen. So as you can see, we've got various different categories like tasks, notifications, appointments, and various other things that you can see. If you are just attending something like an acute hub or something like that, you don't really need to be too worried about a lot of this information because this may be your one and only shift that you're doing. And the main thing you want to figure out is obviously how to find patients, how to find your clinics and do a consultation. And that's what this video is going to focus on. First thing you probably want to figure out is how to search for a patient. And that's dead easy to do. You simply go to this magnifying icon in the top left hand corner and click on search. And then you're able to search for various different categories of things. So you can search for patients either by their name, by date of birth, or just even with their initials. It's important to remember though, if you only put the first initial, then the first name and the second name, you're probably gonna get a lot of patients and that's not gonna be specific enough. I normally recommend at least the first two or three characters of both first and second name or date of birth if you can. We're gonna be using a test patients through our clinics. So things like Minnie Mouse are a classic one that you may see. So that's the basic search thing. There are quick shortcuts throughout System 1 that you can use. So for example, if you wanted to bring up the search quickly, it's F10. However, one of the key areas you're going to want to focus on is your clinics. And there's various different ways you can look at your clinics. So you can go to appointments here at the top left corner, click on that, and then either use the overview or the ledger method to have a look at them. Now different people have different preferences. The majority of people tend to use the appointment ledger. And as you can see, this is a dummy clinic I've set up for the demonstration purpose. And I've got Minnie Mouse and Bugs Bunny due to see me today. If you normally are working in a center or where there's multiple clinics, you'll see various other clinic set up along here for various different people that can be accessed. Alternatively, you may prefer the appointment overview method that looks a little bit like this. And then when you click on it, it zooms in and you can see the patients in a little bit more detail. I must admit this is my preferred way of using clinics, but everybody's got their own preference. I do know the majority prefer the appointment ledger so let's go back to that. So when you want to see a patient, you simply right click on the patient's name and you get various options as you can see here. For example, you could start the consultation straight away by clicking on consultation. I'm not gonna do that just yet. Other things that the patient may have done is arrive themselves either by using the check-in screens or by commenting at the reception. If that's the case, then the reception team will click on the arrive button. Now, because this isn't for a clinic today, it's gonna to ask me an extra question, which is not relevant, but simply are you sure you wanna book this patient in? When you do so, the patient will change colour. And as a result of that, that can indicate that this patient has now arrived in the building rather than being a booked patient. Alternately, in some places, you may see a different colour like this one, which is waiting. It does depend on what your individual areas use in terms of colour coding and stuff. However, what you could also do is just call the patient. This is relevant if you've got call-in screens and stuff that help the, to direct the patient which room they have to go to. But for this purpose, I'm going to start the consultation. So just click on consultation. And as you can see, the patient record will open. Sometimes you may get pop-ups to give you information about the patient. For example, this patient is apparently under the care of our local alliance. You can just ignore that often. Now by clicking on the consultation button, it has automatically taken us into the consultation field that you can see above here. The other thing it's also taken us to is the patient's home screen. So this is effectively the main dashboard that you want to have a look at when you're assessing a patient's records. And the reason for this, there's various different things that can be relevant. So as you can see there's quite a few reminders on Minnie Mouse to give you various pieces of information. So I'm assuming inter means interpreter. And as you can see, there's a more clearer one underneath that explains what this patient needs. In addition, you may see other things, for example, for this one, we've got high risk bloods and some random gobbledygook that's probably there just to demonstrate because this is our test patient. Additionally, you can see various recalls. Yeah, I mean, he's not been so good at keeping up with her chronic health, has she? And also patient status alerts. And things like quaff alerts can also be in here as well. As you can see, Minnie Mouse hasn't had bloods taken for a while despite being on an ACE inhibitor. Really not good there, Minnie. Also eligible for a flu vaccine. Definitely should have had that. Finally, you can see things like allergies as well. 
and if there were pending appointments available, you'd see these underneath here. This is the patient home screen and it's worth having a quick scan of this before you start consultation with the patient. The next thing that most people like to check out when they're assessing a patient's record is the major active problems that you can see here. Now, when you open the record, you may see that this is slightly skewed, but this thing on the left is what we call the clinical tree. This is where most of the information for patients' information is held in various different sections. So, starting at the top, we have the major active problems. And as you can see, there's a tiny little arrow here. If you click on that, you can see it expands to all the various health issues that this patient has. So essential hypertension, apparently a child under safeguarding care, type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, ouch, and epididymitis, quite impressive for a female patient, and various other things that you can see. There also may be inactive problems. So these are normally things that have been a problem in the past, but not relevant currently. As you can see, not much for many doing well there. The summary and family history can be relevant, and if you want to expand that, you simply click on there. The place where you'll be spending most of your time, however, is what we call the tabbed journal. And this is effectively the record of the patient itself. And as you can see, there's various different pieces of information you can pick up from here. It's called the tabbed journal because there's various different tabs in there. So we've got stuff for local data, GP data, community data. So this tends to be things like district nurses or other kind of community support areas, urgent care, you guessed it, things like your out of hours care and stuff may be in there. But where you should normally spend most of your time is everything. So this is literally a list of every clinical encounter and administrative encounter that's happened with a patient that hasn't been deleted. This can sometimes seem like a lot of information and as you can see, there's various different colors that can occur. So green generally means coded information, black generally means free text, and there are various other colors like orange, which will mean things like prescriptions, that's pretty much it really. The other tabs that you can see that have been blurred out are these are extra tabs that you can create either for yourself to pick out particular views. So this one I've got here is actually for myself, all of my own personal consultations. And you can have others for other relevant people if that's helpful. This is probably more useful if you're regularly using System 1. One important feature is the search though. So this empty little box here. And simply by typing anything on here, it will search the tab journal for that code. It doesn't have to be code, but the information you put in. So for example, if I was to type in back, if I was thinking about back pain, then it will search through the record and highlight all the different places it says back. Alternately, you could do different medications or clinical conditions to help give you information about the patient, particularly if it's a large record. As I said, the tab journal is where you gain most of your information about the patient from. Next up, we've got the repeat templates. So these are the regular medications issued to the patient. As you can see, Minnie Mouse is doing quite well. As well as having various antihypertensive drugs like Ramipril and Amlodipine, also taking sodium valproate. And look at that, gummy bears on prescription. Lucky Minnie. Clearly, if you're doing an acute consultation, you're less likely to spend a lot of time in this area, but it's useful to know what this means. So effectively, you've got the date that the medications were authorised, the name of the medication, and in green, you've got the indications for the medication itself. So for example, under paracetamol, which is for some reason here twice, you've got various different indications written. You've got the date of last issue, as you can see here, as well as a review date, which may or may not be accurate depending on the patient, and also issues. Again, it does depend. Some practices use review dates, some practices use issues, to dedicate to the medication review time frame. And that's what this little clock icon is about. So this tells you that the medication review date has been reached. So for many, this was on the 16th of October, 2019. A little bit overdue there. You may see some other icons, like for example, this one that shows that medication has not been issued in 40 days. And this one that suggests that this medication is non-ETP and therefore will cause problems if you try and send this prescription via EPS. The colour coding here is meant to give you an idea of the concordance of the patient. Now, this may not always be reliable because it does depend on the way that the repeat template has been set up. If you wanted to change a template, simply select it, right click and go to amend. Or you can use one of the icons just above it here, which is the same one. By selecting this, you can amend the medication. And this will give you things like the medication's name, 
indications that you can change if need be, the supply of the medications, whether it's number of tablets or amount of liquid, packs, for example, and the duration of the medication repeats itself. This is the thing that determines how well the concordance comes through in terms of information. So if this is not accurate, which unfortunately may not always be, then I'm afraid the concordance won't be. And then this is the review date, which you can change. Ideally, all repeat medication should be recoded to particular codes. As you can see, this isn't, but if you wanted to, you can add it from here. I'm going to cancel this for now, though. If you did want more information about the repeat medications, you can use various pieces of things. Like, for example, the issue history can be quite useful. And as you can imagine, this tells you every single time the medication was issued. An alternate place to get this information is the medication tab here. So this is a chronological list of all the medications that have ever been issued to this patient through the organization. And as you can see, this can spread back for quite a while. I mean, we've got several hundreds of medication issues here. One quick tip that I do recommend using is if you change this all medication tab here to summary, then you'll be able to have a list of all the medications this patient has had in alphabetical order, like that. And this can be useful if you're trying to decide what type of treatment to either consider for a patient that they may have had before or they're looking for in the future. Good example, if a patient states they're penicillin allergic and it does state that on the records and you're wondering if they could tolerate something like cephalexin, for example, as an alternative, actually this will tell you if they've ever had it before and also the number of times they've had it and you can expand that to also give you more details like the timings when that's happened. Alternately, if you're considering things like SSRIs, which ones have they already tried, you can get a quick list of this information just by using this screen. I find it quite useful when we're doing that way. Next thing to be aware of is the vaccination status for patients. And this is clearly more relevant for our younger patient cohorts, but effectively this gives you a list of the various vaccinations and whether or not they're up to date with them or not. You may want to check about any contacts the patients had with the hospital services, so either recent admissions to a hospital or obviously in terms of their regular care with secondary care in terms of outpatients. That's through the communications and letters, and these will normally be filed in chronological order, but you can do adaptations like types of letters to put them into order of which clinics they've been seen in. To look at the letter in more detail, simply highlight it by right clicking and then click on view content. Sometimes you may only have the option of viewing in Windows, and that's because it's a letter that's been sent out rather than a letter that's been sent in. This is just an appointment label for a patient, so less relevant in this case. Unfortunately, Mini doesn't really go to the hospital that often, so there's not many letters here for us to have a look at. But we can try this diabetes letter, so let's have a look at that. As you can see, it's loading up in Word. And there you go, this is Minnie Mouse's invitation to go see the diabetes clinic. Let's just close that, shall we? Occasionally, in some patients, you may find most of this information in record attachments rather than communications and letters, so it's just important to be aware of that. However, more commonly, as you can see, this is where a list of all the Med3s are kept. Speaking of Med3s, this is the tab that you'd use if you want to either look at the previous ones, so the ones that the patients have had, or if you want to generate a new one. And simply by clicking on this little icon here, you can do that, or right-click on the Med3 Statement tab, and new med3. When you do so, you get this little template here that you can see. And it's dead easy to fill in. You either select whether the patient is not fit for work or maybe fit for work. I don't tend to use the issue by hand because I find this much more effective, but you know, I guess you could do if you wanted to. You can select either a coded diagnosis, either from the list that the patient has, or you can select a new one. So click record new. This is the recode browser, so you'll see this in various places and effectively click on that, type in a condition, and then you can add that as a recode to the patient's record for whatever reason that might be. So for example, we could put back pain and then we can select whichever code we prefer. For example, low back pain as an option for their med3. Click OK and that will add a recode and we can either select that as a problem or not. And there we go. If we wanted to give a maybe fit note by selecting that option, we can then add in context such as able to walk short distances and whether we were thought those available for phase return, altered hours, amended duties or adaptations, and then the time frame that you want to give the note for. So you can either select time in terms of one. And we can either go for one week, one month, one day, depending on what you think, or you can select a particular date if that's more suitable. 
You could issue it for six months or indefinitely. Clearly, that should only be used on specific patients, as well as a follow-up assessment required on section. And then simply you click OK and print, and that will issue it directly for you. If you are using things like Accurix, then you can use me other methods such as printer settings to send it to print to PDF. So then you can send that electronically. I'm not going to print one off though. The next section that's worth having a look at is just a little bit lower down, and that's your allergies. So clearly you may want to review this when you're prescribing medications, but we'll come back to that when we issue a medication. And then the pathology section. So this is another one that you can expand, and as you can see, got various different sections such as hematology, biochemistry, endocrinology, and various other subsections. I tend to find it's easier going to the pathology and radiology tab itself, and if there are results, they will all be listed in chronological order here. So things like x-rays, pathology results are all listed there. Unfortunately, I can't show you this section because Minnie Mouse is a test patient and doesn't actually have any results to show you. There's a little bit more detail on this, but it's quite easy to have a look at, and I do tend to find this is a really good way of looking at results for yourself. If you have a safeguarding tab worth having a quick look at it, a good way of knowing if the safeguarding information is you will see this triangle icon or a little red phoenix potentially that's there and that gives you indication there is safeguarding information relevant to this patient. And that's the most of the things. You will see occasionally these extra things like templates and other kind of stuff and particularly if you've got Ardens at the practice, so that's a template mechanism to try and help with your consultations, that may also be listed there in the various different templates that they have. System 1 is really good at having templates to help with things like documentation as well as memory aids to do consultations and stuff. But shall we talk about doing consultation? So this has kind of been here the entire time. This is the consultation bar effectively and you can document your consultations in whichever way you prefer. Some people prefer the freehanded type like I do and don't have this HEDP method but this is the standard way that most people have it when they have consultations. And it's as you can imagine, you type your history in the first box. So patient presented with back pain. I did in a full examination. No red flags. Yada yada. My diagnosis is low back pain, possible sciatica. And then my plan. I'm analgesia, med three, and physio follow up if needed. Clearly my documentation would be a lot better than this if it was a normal consultation, but for the efficacy of the time, I'm not gonna type in everything I would normally do. If you wanted to create an additional problem, you can then have a new section, and then you can do another problem from that region. Also, it's worth noting about something called auto consultations. And particularly if you're working in a place like hubs and stuff, you may see people using these to try and help with the documentation workflow. By clicking on this tab, you get the various options of various different preset consultation types that can exist. So for example, we do a telephone assessment system at our practice, and we have things like the confirmed identity that you can tap on. When you do so, it automatically documents that you've patient, done a patient identity verification, and it puts a quick piece of text on there as well. As you can see by hovering over there, patient contact is part of the GP triage and identity has been checked. Quick, simple way of adding extra consultation information and saving you time effectively. I would suggest that hubs consider using this as a method to try and help with documentation for the right codes, for example, to make sure they're documented well and also relevant information. Templates can work fairly similar to this. And as you can see, there's various different templates that already exist on my toolbar. So for example, we've got things like the patient template here, so this is for documenting things like height, weight, BMI, smoking status, and various other things. We have separate ones for metrics like BP, quick and simple to use, adding the systolic and diastolic blood pressure and the pulse rate for relevance. And if you wanted to look at the BP, I find this one really handy, gives you a diagrammatic reference of all the blood pressure readings. There are various other templates that you can use. They're pretty much simple to understand, click, point, done. However, just to show you, I am going to show you one of the QAF templates, for example. Uh, so if you have a look at asthma, right click and select the asthma template. And as you can see, this is various different pieces of information that you can look at using. So I can input codes for the asthma, sleep codes, daytime symptoms and exercise codes. Tick box to say I've done the annual review and if I want to add text and information, I can do so using the pencil. Important to note, anytime you see a pencil that allows you to add extra text and stuff, and if you do so, quick and easy to do.
Important to note with templates on the right hand side it gives you information as the last time that particular part of the template was used. And sometimes you get views that allow you to extract information as you can see here. So for example, smoking cessation status of the patient. You can click OK to save or cancel to leave if you want to. So we've given you a demonstration of the records itself and how to do a consultation. You may want to issue an acute prescription. And this is clearly something that's useful to know how to do. In order to do so, you simply click on the acute tab here, or if you're in the medication section, you can right click on medication and click new acute. By doing so, it brings up what's called the drug browser. So this is the drug browser and you simply type in the name of the medication. So for example, let's give Minnie Mouse some amoxicillin. You click enter and it gives you various different denominations of amoxicillin. And then you can tap on the one that you want. Please note it gives you the allergy status here to help guide you. And then it gives you various options if this is relevant. And this will be the case if your practice has a prescribing formulary. So I'll ask, for example, does, various options are what you consider. I'll pick that one and that will pre-populate the dosing instructions for me as well. Sometimes you may see synonyms where it gives you different medication options for the other things and that might be data to supply or preferred options for prescribing. So as you can see, this is already filled in the details of amoxicillin 500 milligram capsules. Take one capsule three times a day and supply 15 capsules over a five day period. And then I then can either click OK because I don't need to prescribe any more or OK another and I go through the process again. I'm just going to click OK. Once you've done that, you may want to either print off the prescription or send it EPS. If you want to print it, quick print will allow you to do that and it'll send it to your printer. If you want to send it EPS, then you'd use this icon here. Now, because this is a demonstration model, I can't actually do an EPS option here, but effectively you can either print off all the repeats as it says here, because you authorize his name, and if I was available on EPS, I would be able to nominate the dispenser. So you click on that icon. There's another little kind of spiny image here. Click on that and that will allow you to select the local pharmacy that you want to send it to. I'm not going to print it now. As you can imagine, I don't really want to print off an extra prescription for amoxicillin. But then you can either print it off, print later or not print it at all. Wouldn't really recommend using these for a routine basis, but print them now. I'm going to cancel for this. The last thing we need to do, save the record. It's important that you do that because clearly none of the information you've documented will be kept. You could discard the record, but it's worth noting that if you've issued a prescription to the patient and printed it off in particular, or if you've done similar with a Med3, it won't let you discard the record because you've already done something that's kind of unretrievable in that place. Could mark them an error if that's relevant, but I wouldn't recommend doing that on a regular basis. So let's save and send off all of Minnie Mouse's drugs and stuff. This is where things like protocols may kick in, as you can see. I'm going to select do not print them for this. Don't recommend doing that on a regular basis. And there we go. Mini Mouse has been dealt with and Bugs Bunny hasn't arrived yet. But if I wanted to, I could do Bugs' consultation as well. And that is the basics of using System 1 to do consultations and prescriptions. However, there may be times where you need to send messages to other members of the team, particularly if you're working in the hub or if you're working as a locum. There are three different ways you can message people through System 1. Things like notifications, for example, is a method similar to email that you can send to other people on the System 1 location that you're using. So, for example, if I was to go to User, Notifications, you would see my inbox of all the various different notifications. If I click on New Notification, give an example of what it looks like. So you can pick the person you're sending it to, Subject, and the data, and then send that across. I wouldn't really recommend using this unless you're regularly part of a practice, because there are better ways of doing messaging for various different things. If you just after quick advice from somebody else in the system at that point, so using user and messaging will bring up an option, kind of like an IM message. IM messaging is a great way of sending quick messages to people in the organization at the same time that they're currently live. Um, so for example, I can send a message to myself, although clearly that's going to be pointless, but it will pop up and show you how it works. So I select the name. If you press control, you can select multiple people at the same time if relevant. So click send message and then simply type the message. So. Hello, click OK, and as you can see, the message arrives in the bottom right hand corner. You can still use the consultation features, so the records and stuff, um, whilst that's up there. You can either reply, or postpone, or dismiss. If you postpone, it comes back in a few minutes' time. I tend not to use that. I'll either reply or just leave it there until I don't want it there, or dismiss if it's not relevant. 
If you're looking at clinical messaging when it regards to a patient, then the best way to do that is to use a task. So if you click on the task button, this will open up effectively a task card that you can fill information for. It's so normally automatically defaults to your organization that you're currently working from. And then you can select either groups of people, for example, reception, typists, nurses, whatever is relevant, or individual members of teams if you need to, or even yourself. And this is a good way of keeping track of things like referrals and that kind of stuff if you need to. You can change the task type to various different types that may be relevant for the organization. You can use multiple staff. I tend not to recommend using that in this kind of situation because it's much better used as part of a practice. And you can change the due dates and stuff and flags if need be. Again, less relevant. I would tend to recommend just using the tasks there. You could, however, also use task templates. And particularly if you're working in a new organization, this can be a great way of making sure you've got all the information that's relevant for whatever thing you're doing. So for example, if you have to send a task back to a home practice for a patient you've seen in a hub, using a task template that's specifically designed to populate most of the information, then you just need to fill in the relevant parts, can be really quick and effective. And then you just simply select the one that's relevant. I'm not going to send a task on this basis, but effectively that's how you do it. Last couple of things I wanted to cover. So if you are doing a consultation at a system on practice, one thing you've probably seen at the bottom here is what we call the workflow bar. This is basically all the information about what you need to know. So this first tab here is your pathology results that need filing. I'm not going to hover over them, but effectively this is my results that need filing. These are all the results in the organization, and these are the various unfiled ones for various categories of patients. And then this is the section for, again, all the ones in the organization. I can't really show you this without showing a patient identifiable information, so I'm afraid I can't do that for now. Next section is the outstanding document workflow that needs to be dealt with. So currently there's 48 unfiled document workflows in the organization. Not too bad. This is the appointment scheduler. So this is the current pending appointments for the day. This is the ones currently waiting to see you. These are the ones that are currently in the practice waiting for you and have arrived. And the waiting ones, as we mentioned earlier. As you can see, no view right now. Yay. This is the visit section. This is the total visits for the day, visits allocated to yourself, and the unallocated visits. This section is the EPS prescriptions requiring signing off, and these are the ones relevant and assigned to yourself. And then lastly, we've got the task list, so task assigned only to you, task assigned to you and any groups you're part of, and all the unsigned tasks, less relevant in this situation. You may see a little email sign here. That's if you've got any outstanding notifications. And finally, we've got the search bar here at the bottom corner. If there's anything else you want to find out, it's a really quick and powerful way of finding out information of what to do. You just type in whatever you want and it'll bring it up. So for example, if you type in help, then it'll bring up the help toolbar, various things that you want to do. Dead easy, isn't it? Last thing I wanted to cover, this is slightly more Nottingham centric. If you are using system one, and one of the other additional things that you'll have access to is something called the F12 menu or shortcuts thing. And this has a dashboard of all the relevant information about referrals for patients in the Nottinghamshire region. Simply you click F12 and it will bring up a launcher. This is normally pre-populated, but the one that you want is effectively the F12 Pathfinder. I've got this automatically allocated. If it's not on yours, if you just search F12P and it will come up. And simply by clicking on that, do you need a patient selected? It will bring up the dashboard. As you can see, this is a really complicated looking template that links in to even more complicated templates, but effectively it gives you all the various pieces of information of how to manage a patient from a referral standpoint. So for example, if I wanted to do a two week wait, I can click on that and it will send me to the two week wait pathways for all the various different areas and the information I may need to deal with for that patient. If I wanted to refer a patient, for example, to endocrinology, will take me to the endocrinology page and information about guidelines, referral forms and tasks to make sure the referral goes through. If I want to contact information for various services, I can also access that. So for example, if I was going to mental health, I can click on that and give me various pieces of information, such as if I want to click on adult mental health, it'll give me information like referral forms as well as telephone numbers if need be, as you can see here. It's a really good system and helpful because it's externally updated, so I don't have to worry about the information being correct. It's kept by somebody else to do that. And it can help to streamline the workflow that you've got in terms of referral and other kind of information. This is a Nottingham-centric piece of work, 
great other places have similar versions. Arden's is again a really good option that can help with this and are worth being aware of. As you can see throughout this demonstration, I've had my Accurix toolbar up here, not currently signed in, so unfortunately I can't demo that, but check out our other videos that show you how to use Accurix more effectively. I hope you found that useful as an effective way of trying to understand how to use System 1 quickly and effectively, and a brief whistle-stop tour for how to use it. If you've got any comments or questions, feel free to contact me as ever, um, through EGP Learning or at dotgundal 52 on whichever social media platform you prefer. If you are listening on the podcast, make sure you leave us a review. Really appreciate it if you did that, especially on iTunes. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and ring the bell to get notified of all of our content first and foremost. And always leave a comment, I guarantee you reply. And as ever, EGP Learning is here to help save you and your patients' time by tech enhancing your primary care and learning. Catch you in the next episode.